my, uh, my phone freaking days and just kind of very briefly co cover it. I didn't hear the, I didn't understand the German part, so I'm just might, I might repeat something in English. So, uh, basically, um, this is a Captain Crunch whistle, and if you glue the third hole and blow it like this, that's 2600 hertz tone, and that tone is used uh, by the American telephone system as a hang-up signal to hang up the phone on a trunk level. There are basically two levels of the phone system. There's the subscriber level, which is the phone you get in your home, and you pick up your phone, you get a dial tone, and you can dial a number, and it goes through. But there's also a trunk level access to the phone number, which controls the trunks between the different cities. And each city has their own routing codes, and you can put these routing codes together, and you could make your calls jump all over the place. And uh, this, came, this came very, very handy for certain antics that I did. I'll talk about that later. Um, it all started with the Esquire article. Um, that's when it actually became public knowledge of the existence of phone freaks. Uh, basically, uh, it came out in 1977, and the uh, article was The Secrets of the Little Blue Box, written by Ron Rosenbaum. Now, Ron Rosenbaum was contacted by one of these people who were building and making blue boxes for the mafia or for bookmaking purposes, and was using the blue box incorrectly. Instead of dialing an 800 number, they would dial um, a local information number or just an information number. But when you call an information operator, uh, the distant operator, when she answers the phone, it doesn't go off hook. It means it's on hook, which means that uh, it didn't really answer. So you're not really built for the call. Uh, 800 numbers, it didn't matter. They were free anyway. And because of this, uh, these off hook signals were being detected by the phone company. And very quickly, they were busted. Uh, phone freaks got a hold of this person and uh, chastised them for doing such stupid things like this. And once I read that article, uh, I, was, I was going to San Jose City College. I was just finish, finishing up with my chemistry class. I went to my car and kind of chilled a little bit and went across the street and picked up the article. I read it cover to cover, and I, I missed a couple classes as a result, but I couldn't put that article down. I said to myself, after that article was done, I says, oh my God, that ends phone freaking as we know it today. And from that point on, I completely got rid of all my hardware and made sure that I didn't have anything like that kicking around the house anymore. It was, it was that bad. I knew that my days were numbered. Uh, uh, the only thing that was really protecting me was the knowledge of my phone number. And uh, I was then interviewed on KPFA, and Steve Wozniak caught the interview, as well as saw the uh, Esquire article on the coffee table of his house. He showed it to Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs says, let's make and sell them. <laughs> and so Woz, uh didn't know the frequencies. He didn't suspect that the frequencies given in the Esquire article were correct. But he happened to know how to get a hold of the Bell System Technical Journal at Stanford Library. And right there, before their very eyes, were all the frequencies that he ever needed to know to make and use a blue box. But the only thing is, he didn't know how to use it. So he contacted me through KPFA. And I was a little bit paranoid at first. Uh, but I decided to go over there and, and visit him in the dorm. And he had his blue box set up and connected to the phone line. And he, sh he asked me how to use it. I said, uh, I, li I listened to the tones of the blue box, and, and it, it, it sounded horrible. He was using square wave uh, frequencies instead of sine waves. Now, the phone system back then is analog. When you put a square wave into an analog circuit, you tend to make a little bit of noise. Extra noise can be detected by the phone company, at which time I strictly warned Waz. I said, please don't use this thing on a regular basis. You will be busted. He decided to sell them anyway, and with the money that he used to sell the blue boxes, he made enough money to print out 25 PC boards for the Apple I, which he was selling at the uh, bite shop in uh, Palo Alto. And uh, after I showed him how to use it and warned him about the flaw in the box, he says, can I call somebody? And I says, who do you want to call? He says, well, I want to call the Pope. I said, okay. Uh, let's see, that's the Vatican, right? That's in Rome. Okay, let me get Rome information. And let's get the number to the Vatican. 
So after many, many tries, because his blue box was flawed, it took quite a, quite a few tries to get the blue box to actually persuade it to work. But if he held the mouthpiece uh, against the mouthpiece of the phone, uh, held it at, at just the right distance, it would put uh, enough quality of the tones in there where the phone company would actually accept the call. We managed to get the Vatican on the phone, but the Pope was not available, even though it was 4 o'clock in the morning. He basically wanted to tell the uh, person that he wanted to confess because he was Henry Kissinger. But then again, that's how what Boaz does. He likes to play jokes. One time his car broke down, um, and he goes to a payphone, and Jobs says, let's see if this blue box works. So he tries to make a blue box call on a payphone. I warned him, I says, never try to make it from a payphone because the operator will tell when you do it. And the operator could come on the line when he bangs out the number. But uh, just at about the time he pulls out the box, the cop pulls up and uh, asking him about some, whether they've seen somebody walk by or something. And, and the cop said, what's that? And they're pointing to the blue box. Because he kind of hit, he kind of very blatantly hit, hit it behind his back. And... Uh, he said, oh, that's my synthesizer. He says, I built this uh, for my classes at Berkeley. And Kyle handed it back to him and said, a guy by the name of Moog beat you to it. <laughs> Moog is a mix uh, music synthesizers, by the way. Uh, many, many years have passed since that time, and uh, I, I've been, always been in touch with Waz. And every, time, every now and then I'll go over to his house, and he lived in Sunnyvale at the time, and he's got these little white mice, and he... He loves them because he likes the way they wiggle their whiskers, but he's allergic to mice. He's always got sick and has a cold and stuff like that, but he still likes to, to do this. Uh, at the time, there was a company called Cartravision, which went out of business, and Steve bought all of the existing Cartravision video player, video recorders, these big old hairy hanging cartridges that were twice as big as the biggest VHS you can ever find. And he, they only can record about 30 minutes of video. And he bought a whole bunch of these machines, and he fixed them up. And uh, he uses them for whatever. And uh, so uh, at that time, I was working for Call Computer, which uses a BTI System 2000. It's really just nothing more than an HP 2000 uh, running uh, the BTI system version of BASIC. And I had a part-time job there, basically taking the library and uh, taking all of the electronic programs that I could find in IEEE Journal and typing them in to the library of the computer so that I could make these programs available to electrical engineers because that's what I was at the time. Waz wanted to uh, build a TV terminal. Uh, in other words, this little device, it used the UART, and uh, it would have 40 characters on a line. And, uh, and he wanted to make this for call computer. And uh, he got it to work, uh, but due to some disagreements with the owner of Call Computer, they never, it never saw the light of day. It was kind of uh, sad. But uh, with 40 characters on a line, it really wasn't that, that useful anyway. And it had a UART, a little TV transmitter called a modulator, which was used to tune to channel 3, and then you could watch it on your TV set, your, your text, 40 columns. And uh, then he used Call Computer to cross-assemble the 6502, um, and that exact code is in the original, uh, the original Apple II manual called the Red Book. How many of you heard of the Red Book? Aha, we have a few old timers around here. That's good. The Apple II. Okay. Well, the Apple II is a far better design than the Apple I. It comes with uh, 40, 4K or 48K models. And uh, there it... Uh, Initially came with a motherboard, a keyboard, a modulator for the TDRF interface. That in itself is a different story. Steve really argued and wanted the modulator to be in the Apple II, and, but instead of having it be a separate modulator. But there's one problem. The FCC, Federal, Federal Communications Commission, they control all TV emissions, and everything has to be type approved. A type approved process for this device would have taken several years. So what they did was they just simply bought these modulators off the shelf and included them in every single Apple II that was sold, as well as a Panasonic monaural cassette recorder, which seemed to be the best recorder to use to basically record uh, your, your, your program and play it back and load it back in the machine again. And he used a very clever algorithm to do that, and I still to this very day he told me, he explained it to me one time how he did it. I still don't understand it. This guy's way beyond me. 
uh, eventually, uh, Jobs uh, had, a, had an, uh, an outsource uh, company uh, make the molded case for the Apple II, which had the keyboard be embedded inside and, uh, and a place to put the, to connect your, they had like two jacks for connecting in your, your Panasonic recorder. And the floppy disks eventually came out about eight, eight to 10 months later. And again, Steve Wozniak was a cutting edge in the floppy disks. He used the same algorithm that he used for recording on the Panasonic uh, cassette recorder for also recording very high density on, uh, on the standard uh, uh, ANAB, in, I mean the standard uh, floppies, 140 characters on the floppy, and you could just flip the floppy upside down. You could actually use two sides of the floppy, which was kind of cool. A lot of computers will not let you actually do that. Um, okay, let's see. All during the time between the Apple I and the Apple II, I was serving time at Lompoc Federal Prison. And I had a four-month stint there, which really actually turned out to be three and a half months. And during that time, I bought a radio from the commissary, and I modified the radio to uh, took a few turns off the local oscillator of the radio so that I could listen to the uh, 152 megahertz uh, walkie-talkies that the uh, guards used. So I was tapping the guards into the walkie-talkie. And I also built a little jammer circuit along with it so that when you press the button, it put a tone over that frequency and can jam their walkie-talkies. I didn't tell anybody about that part of it. But uh, it came very useful when, when there was some incident happening. And, we, and uh, there were basically two different halves of the prison. There was A building and B building. And if the guards were over doing a count on A building and there was nobody over in B building, then when they came over, we, we got their walkie-talkie information so we knew when they were coming which was kind of nice, actually. And so uh, my particular job at the prison was uh, I was working in the piggery, a pig farm. I used to work at a farm a long time ago, and I knew a little bit about farming techniques and how to handle animals. And uh, what I did was I marked on the pig the name of the judge that sentenced me. <laughs> they did not like that very well. After I got out of Lompoc Federal Prison, I... Uh, Went back up to the Bay Area and uh, got a hold of Steve, and he offered me a part-time job at Apple to uh, design and build the telephone interface board, affectionately called the Charlie board. Uh, it deployed a 256 sine wave table, which we generated using call computer. And uh, we had basically two pointers skipping along the table, generating the two tones. So a pointer would go from here to here to here. It would skip every 10 or 15 frequencies every 10 or 15 sine values to make the two frequencies. So only one sine wave table would, could then be used to make two tones. And all you had to do is just know how far to skip it ahead to get the exact frequencies that we wanted, and we could get it to within at least half a percent accuracy, which was pretty good considering it was only a 256 sine wave table. It just so happened that the frequencies kind of worked out that way. The first pass use an 8-bit uh, ADC and, and DAC. ADC stands for, analog, if you don't know already, analog digital converter, and DAC is digital to analog converter. So it had 16 uh, control ports for relays. Um, was deemed the ADC too expensive, proposed using a 6-bit DAC, and getting the other two bits from the address line. So what we did was we had a 6-bit DAC, and we took two bits from the address line, and we used those two bits from the address line to uh, basically uh, put, the, uh, to put into the DAC. And it worked quite well, actually. Amazing. The only thing is, you had to have about two to 300 lines of extra code. And Steve's idea was, well, code is free. Parts aren't. So OK, I didn't disagree with him. The capabilities of the phone line was amazing. It had a programmable phase lock loop which you program in the frequency, and uh, that frequency, if heard, will then trigger one of the 16 ports. So uh, if I want to listen for 700 hertz tone, I would program in a binary value that would program the, the programmable phase lock loop to listen for 700 hertz tone. And when it finds it, it triggers one of the 16-bit ports. So in the 16-bit port, I would just simply peek that memory address. And if it's positive, tone's there. If it's negative, the tone's not there. And so we used it to detect tones. 
uh, we, we, in order to detect two tones using a single phase lock loop, we'd first listen for the first tone and then we reprogram it very quickly to listen for the second tone. And both of those two were true, then we knew that we got the tone for the two frequencies. And we actually were able to, did a little trial, and we were actually able to make a 110 baud modem out of it. But the problem was is just how fast it took for those phase lock loops to actually trigger and switch on. And that was our biggest, kind of one of our biggest problems. But we got around it by using some pretty clever techniques. Uh, the touch tones, busies, uh, even voice messages, as long as these messages were uh, very consistent, we can tell the difference between, we're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed, or the number you dialed is not a working number. So those two are actually can be detected with a phase lock loop, and the differences can actually be be reasonably accurate, I'd say 80 to 90% accuracy. But we were also able to generate dial tones, ring tones, busy tones, and all of the other uh, required tones using this sign table in the thing. Uses for the phone board, answering machines. Uh, at the time, there were no voicemail uh, back then, and answering machines costed around $400, but a person can just use a regular standard Panasonic uh, tape recorder for recording the messages and controlling the recorder using those uh, ports uh, on the phone board. The phone board just had some relays connected to it. And all you have to do is just plug a cassette recorder into one of the relays, and we just switch on and off the recorder to play the outgoing message or record the incoming message. Remote appliance control. Uh, we were using two of the 16 ports, giving, giving us 14 ports that we can play around with uh, 14 lights or 14 appliances that we can both listen to and detect the state of that appliance as well as control that appliance. We did this by having it beep a series of beep tones. So if the light is switched on, uh, every tone would go five lights, go beep, 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 beep. Okay, oh, then that, that light is turned on. We need to turn it off. So you'd send a tone, a code, the, the phone board would detect it and say, okay, switch the light off. Uh, so this would be useful for like the smart home. But back then, smart homes were science fiction. You know, they didn't exist. Um, war dialing. Now this is what I used it for. Uh, you give it an exchange code and it finds all the computer access codes, uh, all the computer access numbers, watch lines, maps, all valid 800 numbers in an exchange. And that was how I found the CIA crisis hotline to the White House. And we all, know, we all know the story about how I accessed the CIA crisis hotline number by tapping into the line and uh, by listening to who it was uh, that, that would bring up President Nixon. And uh, we found his code name as Olympus. A couple weeks later, we called up. Uh, but before that, I had to find out wh where that 800 number went. And when we first called that number, the person who answered the phone was really rude. And why would somebody be rude when an 800 number is paid for by that party uh, to uh, receive a call? Well, uh, I had to do a little social engineering, and I called a guy back up a couple of weeks later, and I says, "This is," uh, I told him, "This is a phone company in White Plains, New York, and we're having a translation problem into this number. Which number have we reached, sir?" And they gave us. The number. I said, you've reached this number. This is a CIA crisis hotline number in the White House. Thank you, sir. We'll fix it right away. And I hung up. It's all I needed to know. And at that point, I found the, uh, for every 800 number, there is an equivalent seven-digit number using six-digit translation. Because a 4A switch, the long-distance switch, does six-digit translation, which means that it'll translate uh, 800-424 into 202-456 leaving the last number, 9337, that was the actual number, by the way, to be the, the number for the, for the White House's CIA crisis hotline. And so that was how we got the crisis hotline. And we knew that President Nixon's code name was, was uh, Olympus. A week or so later, I go to a, a phone freak gathering, and everybody likes to trade codes and stuff like that. So... Uh, this guy, I, I wanted this Watts line. This guy had this amazing AT&T conference bridge. You can conference up to 10 conversations together. It directly converted the touch tone, which is different frequencies, than the blue box tones, which are called multi-frequencies. So they were using two tones. The multi-frequency tones were used to switch between cities at the trunk level access. 
The touch tones were used for subscriber phones for touch tone dialing, like we're using them today. Okay, so uh, well, I told the guy, well, well, well here's a number. Well, why don't you, I'll, I'll give you this number uh, in return. He says, what's that number? I says, this is the number of the, this is the CIA crisis hotline to the White House. And if you want to talk to President Nixon, you just ask for uh, Olympus. He says, oh, I don't believe it. Oh, really? The White House? Try it. So uh, I said, but before you do, I want an exit strategy so I can get the hell out of there as quick as I can. Uh, I insisted that they stacked a few tandems to get uh, to uh, avoid being traced. Sure enough, we asked for Nixon. Sure enough, his voice came on, and the guy was just being a dork. And he says, sir, we have a crisis on our hands. Sir, we're out of toilet paper. <laughs> and so I guess that was the first instance of being able to prank or punk the president. And so... Uh, other than word dialing, of course, a modem is also other uses for the uh, phone board as well. And why wasn't it marketed? Well, rules and regulations, of course, always come into play, especially relating to directly connecting to the phone line. It was illegal and actually against not only the phone company laws, but against actual state and federal laws to connect anything to the phone line, not even so much as a speaker. And so, and they can usually tell because the phone company measures resistance to these lines all the time. And if you do do something funny, like hook up an illegal extension to your phone, they'll know about it almost immediately. And so uh, Steve Jobs also got excessive pressure from Ma Bell and legal threats for uh, uh, marketing that phone board. Uh, of course, the FCC had to have their little hands in it also. It had to be type approved. So the legal concerns on how it can be used uh, was a little bit iffy. And of course, the biggest thing were, were the phone board could have evil thoughts. You could make it uh, send uh, not only touch tones, which was what it was intended for, but you can also put the blue box tones in there. And, that, and therefore, the Charlie board could have evil thoughts, as the judge liked to say it when I went to court. And it was too powerful for its own good. It was just too many things it could do. It was so versatile that, uh, that, that it was kind of scary. And Apple kind of backed out of the deal. And uh, the only other legal way to actually connect this device up to the phone company would be using an interface device at a rental of about $100 a month, and it didn't even work. Uh, DC Hayes, of course, came out a couple years later with their DC Hayes modem, and somehow they got around the legal restriction. But I guess money talks and bullshit walks. What can I say? Two kinds of the phone board existed. There was a 12-chip 12, 12 version. This was my own design with the 8-bit ADC and DAC. 16 ports, 256-byte uh, sign table. Only, uh, only existed in a wire-wrapped version of it, and it was like the prototype of the prototype. Uh, later on, I had a design session with Steve Wozniak at his favorite restaurant, the Bob's Big Boy. That restaurant, we cut a hole in, this, in, in a fence uh, behind the 7-Eleven store so we didn't have to walk all the way around. And he'll print little, little uh, notes on the menus of Bob's Big Boy and little tablets of Alka-Seltzer saying, for your convenience. Uh, so we'd meet at the Bob's Big Boy and we'd have little napkin session parties and he'd kind of give me some ideas about how to use the 8-bit ADC DAC combination and using the address line instead of uh, the data line for those two extra bits that we needed. And uh, so then we designed the PC board and we made about 10 prototypes. And in 1978, I was brought back to Apple to make and test 10 more prototypes, about a year and a half later. And an attempt to find the original documentation is being made with little to no, little to no success. However, uh, this uh, person who wrote a book called Exploding the Phone by Phil Lapsley actually has, in, as part of the supplementary information, the ATT's analysis of the phone board. Because, you see, I had moved to Pennsylvania at the time, and I, had a, I was going to have a, a coming home party, an open house party. I invited all my East Coast phone freak friends to come over. Somehow they got access to my computer when I was out, out in the woods entertaining some people. And I, there was helicopters flying around and stuff. I said, oh, I wonder what all this stuff's about. Finally, two troopers come up to me and identified themselves. And I says, and I identified myself. They said, we got him. 
you know, I was immediately arrested, read my rights, led back to the house. By that time, there was maybe 10 or 15 people that were already in handcuffs all laying inside the house there. And it was just because some friends got a hold of my software and used my software for uh, doing something they weren't supposed to do that attracted attention to why I got busted. And so uh, it was during that time that uh, AT&T then took the uh, phone board and uh, Bell Labs was in New Jersey at the time and they took and analyzed the phone board and they documented it 10,000 times better than I could do it. They reverse engineered it. They did everything. So I have that document. Actually, you get the document from, uh, from the, the book. Going on, uh, uh, I, I, I served my time in Pennsylvania and uh, I taught everybody how to do it for my own survival. And uh, during that time, I come, went back to California and I uh, ran across uh, Bill Ragsdale from the fourth interest group booth who had just completed uh, meta compiling fourth for the Apple, fourth version 1.6. I was going to buy Bill's meta compiler so I could be able to compile a, 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 an image myself, but he wanted too much money for it. <laughs> so I had to use his, his version, but that was okay. Um, each fourth back then had a three character plus a length for the fourth word. Like the word, like the word execute would be EXE, and then the rest of it would be like seven or eight, a number after that would be the, the, the unique identifier for the, for the actual fourth word. Later on, of course, the fourth Im implementation team changed that to have a lot more characters. So I wrote a program in fourth called Easy Writer. Now, after I came back to California, of course, I had to see the judge because they, they revoked my probation. So I had a probation revocation hearing, and I met the very judge that sends me for the very first time at the request of my attorney, uh, Judge Peckham. And uh, my attorney was able to talk the judge into working out a deal between Alameda County and the federal government to allow me to be incarcerated at the cost of Alameda County. The federal government actually paid Alameda County for me to be in jail. And it was called a work furlough program. I had to pay rent, $150 a month, to go to jail. But I was allowed to go home, and I was allowed to leave in the morning and go to a job, work, and then come back to jail at night, put into my skivvies and my jail clothes, and that was it. So it turned out to be one of the most perfect situations for writing a program ever. I mean, when I was at the computer, I was hacking away code, building a meta compiler, building my, uh, my source level debugger and all my other stuff that I needed to build EasyWriter with. And then at the very end of the day, I would print it out in a nice QM printer donated by Steve Wozniak, who donated uh, the computer, I mean the printer, so that I can use proportional spacing, not Proportional spacing between the words, but proportional spacing between the letters using the QM commands. And it was the only word processor that supported direct proportional spacing. And that's what really made that program fly. So as I was writing EasyWriter in fourth, the EasyWriter program only took up 6K of RAM. That's it. 6K of RAM, and that included the fourth interpreter, which was 2. 3.6K of RAM, and the rest of, of it that made up the 6K was the actual Easy Writer word processor part of it. And the rest was used for text. Uh, we went to the uh, fourth West Coast Computer Fair. How ironic. Uh, I ran across this guy, Matthew McIntosh, from the Apple Pie user group in San Francisco that had a booth at the computer fair and agreed to demonstrate Easy Writer at the booth. Right next door to the Apple Pie booth was the fourth interest group booth. What a perfect symbiotic relationship that was. The people that go to our booth would say, what language is it written in? We just point next door. The guys over at the fourth side of the booth says, well, what programs have been written in fourth? They just point to the Apple Pie booth. We had crowds and crowds of people. We couldn't copy those dis disks fast enough. Michelle, she lived about maybe three or four blocks away from the Brooks uh, Convention Center. This was before Moscone was built. And uh, she would come back and forth with boxes and boxes of diskettes that we were, she was copying. And we couldn't sell, we couldn't copy them fast enough. 
with the money that we made, um, when, once I got out of my work fellow program, I got an apartment and I started to work on, uh, and at, at that point uh, we decided which company we wanted to go with. We got offers from Broderbund, we got offers from Hayden Books, we got offers from just about every conceivable software, pro, uh, software vendor. We decided to go with Information Unlimited Software because they had this really cool program called What's W-H-A-T-Z-I-T. Wow, hold that, wow, hold that, how'd all that stuff get in there? And that was the name of the program. It was a really stupid program, but, but it was, and the, the amount of royalties we got were, were really astounding, 40% of net, and not, no, 40% of gross, which was amazingly high. And so we went with them, and they worked out quite well, actually. Um, and so uh, during that time, uh, at that fourth West Coast computer fair, Steve Wozniak comes excitedly running to our booth and says, come over to the Apple booth right away. There's going to be an incident. Okay, fine. So I go over to the Apple booth, and there's Randy Wigginton with something behind his back talking to Dave Gordon. Dave Gordon was the head of the L.A. Uh, Apple II user group. And Dave had somehow took the monitor ROM for the Apple IIe, which was different than the monitor ROM for the regular Apple II, and put it into a RAM chip inside the machine, you know, kind of pirating it. And Apple got really pissed off about that. So Randy Wigginton thought he'd get even with him by taking and throwing an apple cream pie in his face at the Apple booth. That's when Steve Wozniak also had this little brochure he was handing out called the, the, the uh, Zaltair, Z-A-L-T-A-I-R. And what it is, it was this fictitious uh, product that had a WOM, the first WOM ever. It was called the write-only memory. <laughs> and uh, he was passing them out, and people were looking for the boo stuff. It was crazy. But, uh, and all during that time, I was still in jail. They'd let me out. The, they'd let me out of the jail. They'd let me go over to the Brooks Convention Center, and after I, I had to come back at 6:30, so I drove back across the Bay Bridge back to Oakland, where I had my 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 work fellow program, and uh, and I couldn't go to any of the parties, but heck, at least I went to the show, and uh, then Matthew McIntosh, my my business partner, would uh, then uh, work out the deals with. Uh, he'd come visit me every weekend, talking about the different uh, royalties. And we'd look at all the different contracts that he, gave, he we got from our, our thing, and we decided to go with Information Unlimited Software as our, as our marketing thing. So by the time I got out, Information Unlimited Software was just moving from Indiana to Kensington, which is north of Berkeley, had a little office space there. And uh, we started to uh, make and manufacture uh, the original Easy Writer, 80 col uh, 40 column Easy Writer. Now, you can actually get a copy of any working copy of Easy Writer off of the web. Uh, there's an Apple II emulator on, on a Windows machine that you can get that, and you can also get the Easy Writer, Easy Writer uh, binary files along with the Easy Writer manual. I did this when I was in, uh, in Sweden, when I was in Stockholm. Uh, we, uh, we got a, an Apple II emulator, and we ran Easy Writer on it, and it worked. Every single feature worked perfectly. I couldn't believe it. So there, it's out there if you want to play with it. You just have to know where to get it. Uh, I didn't have time enough to pull out the URLs of these places, but because uh, it, 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 the reason why the guy's actually out of town, so I didn't get the URLs. But it's there. You just have to look for it. Um, while I was writing it in jail, there was uh, a gas crisis. Uh, this was when gas started really, get, really climbing up. There was really rare long lines to gas stations and stuff like that. This was in 1979. Because uh, that's, that's, and then we got out, I think, in July 1979. And Easy Rider was built on fourth version 1.6. And uh, it only had uppercase characters because the Apple II did not have lowercase. It only had uppercase. So because of that, what we did was, when I wanted to capitalize a word, I just hit the escape key and then the next character I type would show up as inverse video on the screen. But when you printed it out, it would print out as uppercase. And everything else that printed in, no in normal non-inverse video would actually be converted to lowercase when you print it out. And then you had a little, uh, it had another little uh, feature called uh, you can view what it printed out. You can only view the first 40 columns and then the second 40 columns. 
And uh, so you could actually kind of get an idea of what it would look like, but it wasn't what you see, what you get kind of a thing, you know. But I did have dot commands. I did have dot L for set the left margin, dot L10, dot R20, dot R50 for the right column. Uh, and we had, and those commands were the same commands as electric pencil because the electric pencil was the word processor to get back when you had uh, CPM. And so uh, that was kind of cool. So uh, as, uh, as more and more companies started offering out, uh, outside third-party uh, vendors, uh, Bill uh, Baker, the president of IUS, got a hold of three major companies that offer 80-column support for the Apple II, the Videx, the m and and one other I don't remember. And they all offered us a board and detailed on how to use them. So then the next thing I did was I had to build a VMI. I called it a virtual machine interface. Back then, we call them today drivers for each of them. So we, and we supported character level, proportional spacing, and QM. And the new Easy Writer Pro is built around fourth version 1.7. It had a lot of extra features, a little bit faster. IBM, UBM, we all BM for IBM. Now this was uh, really strange. Uh, with the money that we were making from Easy Writer Pro, I took my mom and my dad and my brother on a vacation to Hawaii. We went back to Hawaii, Bill Baker called me into his office at IUS. And there were these three gentlemen in suits. And I said, uh-oh. Are these FBI? I was freaking out. Because I, I wasn't doing anything really funny, even though I was on this ocean liner and I was kind of freaking around on the phone system on the boat. But I really wasn't doing anything illegal. I was just kind of experimenting. And so uh, we uh, decided to, uh, these guys handed us this piece of paper and says, read and sign. Okay, well, basically, uh, that piece of paper was that we weren't supposed to divulge the names of the individuals that we were to meet, nor who they worked for, nor any other details about the thing. They were from IBM. They wanted to know how long it would take to port Easy Rider Pro to the IBM PC. IBM was planning to come out with a personal computer. This was eight months before it actually came out. And so we had to figure out, first of all, what processor they used. It took them a week to give us this information. They were afraid to give us the information on the processor because they thought it was too secret of information. It didn't take us long to figure out that an 8088 processor was really the same as an 8086 processor, which was a 16-bit version of the 8088, which was the 8-bit version. Boy, were we lucky. We got a hold of a, a product that supported the 8086 OS and it was Seattle Computer Product DOS, written by Tim Patterson. And we got a TEI mainframe with 8-inch floppies, and we ported forth on it in about a week, thanks to the fourth interest group people. Uh, eight months prior to the IBM release, we got our PC. Surprise, surprise. Bill Gates bought the same DOS that we were using to develop forth on the IBM PC from Tim Patterson for $50,000. We couldn't believe our luck. Here we had it. We had, an, we had the same operating system that we've been developing for maybe three or four months right there in our hands on an IBM PC, and it was the exact DOS 1.0. And so all we had to do was to port forth over, we just simply took the forth.hex which was generated by fourth, the compiler, fourth.asm, compiled it into fourth.hex, and then we did binhex, fourth.x, to make it into a fourth.com file. So I go upstairs to uh, where the uh, IBM people were still there, and I says, you guys got to come down here and check this out. IBM people were just turning white. They said, oh, something wrong with our computer? Oh, no, I don't think so. I gathered them around the computer, and it was sitting there, and it says, A greater than sign. There was nothing else there. And I told them, I says, during our contract negotiations, basically, I spec'd out that it would take us about six months to port forth on the IBM PC, I'm not knowing, of course, I had this very lucky break. And so I told them, I says, uh, remember when I told you guys it would take us six months to port forth on your machine? He says, yeah, well, guess what? I lied. 
it's already on your machine, here it is. Fourth, bing, come back, and said, okay. So I got fourth running on the machine in 20 minutes. IBM, of course, was in total misbelief. Uh, the next thing I had to do was I had to take the fourth source code, which was in fourth, and compile it onto the fourth system, which we already had on the IBM PC now. Uh, we had a Corvus Constellation hard drive, 10 megabyte, with ribbon cables running into every office. So we had probably four or five. This was our network. Our network didn't have cables, no TCP IP back then. It was just these big, giant ribbon cables that would take uh, that hardware, those hardware Corvus signals and multiplex them into, uh, into these different uh, Apple II computers that we were has. We had one person working on the print subsystem. We had another person working on, uh, on easy, what was it? We had easy, uh, easy writer, then we had easy data and some other kind of other programs that we were building at the same time using the same source. Uh, and it was all in the Corvus. So I said, well, gee, uh, how are we going to get that data from the Corvus onto the IBM PC? And I says, uh, Doug, hand me that parallel card a minute. Got the schematic of the parallel card, and the parallel card actually lets you can do, it had a bi-directional gate there. You could do both input and output. But the gate, the read-write line was soldered to ground. Because only was an output, uh, uh, it was a parallel output, not an input thing. So we lifted the pin off, we cooked the NAND gate to it, and then, uh, and then we, log we switched the logic around, and then we, we experimented around with, uh, when we hooked it up to the Corvus directly, not through the Constellation, just for testing purposes. And after diddling around with timing, and things like that, we was able to read the data from the Corvus onto the IBM PC memory blocks. And then we built, we wrote a block, which is a fourth word for reading blocks of data from the disk, and an emit, which takes a character that you type in on the screen. And we had a fully functioning uh, disk driver made out of a parallel card. And we were able to read the source code for fourth the very next day. Well, after we showed IBM this fourth running on the machine, Paul Chasen, which was our IBM contact in Boca Raton, Florida, called uh, his people back in Boca Raton and says, you guys got to come out here right away. I don't care. I want you out here now. So the very next day, we picked them up uh, from the airport. We brought them over to Kensington. And by the time they got there, we already had the editor working. The Easy Writer editor was actually functioning and working. Word wrapped the whole bit because it was source. It was it was fourth, and fourth was so portable back then that we could do this. And of course, it came up how we were able to how we were able to read the data from the Corvus. Well, IBM's brought over a hardware engineer. They brought over a software engineer, and they brought over one or two project managers to see this thing actually work. And when they found out that we modified their parallel card, man, the shit hit the fan. They were so ticked off. They took away our card. They set us back three weeks. And the only way we could get the fourth working on that box now was to actually use a serial card and tie up an Apple II, because the Apple II would take the fourth source from the Corvus, just send it over 9600 baud to the to the IBM PC to load the fourth, uh, you know, the fourth screens up. The compile took about twice as long because they had to go through the serial port instead of the parallel port. We were pushing releases just about every few days, but eventually they blocked the final release. And that was the final blow to our sales because there was only one thing we had to do was to basically get Easy Writer program to work on the IBM's uh, disk system because we wrote our own disk operating system in the Easy Writer, because Apple wouldn't release the uh, details of how we can interface to their DOS. It wasn't until like two or three years later that a book came out called Inside Apple DOS, which finally gave us the secrets that we would have, could have used, but that was two years too late. So I wrote my own DOS. It took me two days to do it, but I did it. It had a bitmap, just like a regular DOS did, and uh, we had, t we had uh, 10, 24 byte blocks of data that we would use for our, uh, for our data. And then whenever, a, whenever a, a block was saved to disk, we would find that the next 
free block and we would set that bit on and now that block was in use. So we were able to, uh, and each file had its own little bitmap uh, where the bits were, uh, where those files were in sequential order. And that was how we were able to locate the, where the files were on the disk. And we were pushing releases just about every few days. We were hitting them too fast and too hard and their, their beta testing thing was just totally uh, kind of messed up. So this is pretty much the end of my talk. Uh, so now I want to kind of open things up for questions. And, uh, and anything, is, anything is open. I mean, because I, I talked about anything about Apple or anything like that back in that day. Excuse me. Um, well, so I, un as I hope I understood you co correct. So IBM released the PC in 1981 without a word processor. No, it, it came with EasyWrite. EasyWrite was uh, a bundle. Uh, so. Every single IBM PC sold. In fact, it, it, in fact, the first version of the Apple II was released in 1981. A computer museum called the Living History Museum, which was funded by uh, Bill Gates and uh, the rest of the people at Microsoft, and uh, it was there was a reception. Bill was there in the reception, and I walk up to Bill and I says, "Hey, Bill, do you know who I am?" He said, "No." I says, "I'm the guy that beat you to the punch and got Easy Rider bundled on every IBM PC sold before you got your word pro word program out, because we beat them by about six months." actually, before they got their word out. But once their word processor came out, it had a lot more functions and stuff than, than Easy Writer. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you very much for your great uh, anecdotes. I have a question more about your background. Could you... I read in the Wikipedia that you uh, were working for the, uh, uh, what was it, uh, for the air um, military? For the military uh, industry, uh, industry as an engineer, like uh, for, the, for the Air Force, sorry, yeah, my English. So can you tell us a little bit what you did in that time? Um, okay, I joined the US Air Force in 1964, did four years uh, as service. In the Air Force, uh, I went to uh, Keesler Air Force Base Tech School, where I learned all about uh, systems in the Air Force, including how to protect things from atomic bombs and everything else like that. And so I learned uh, a lot about uh, the radar systems used in the, in the Alaskan Dew Line area. And uh, these were AC and W, AC and W stands for Air, Con Air Control and Warning Systems. Um, and while I was up there was, of course, I had all the time in the world to uh, explore the uh, military phone system. And uh, it didn't take me long to figure out that I could use the military phone system to make calls to anywhere I wanted to go, uh, which, of course, kind of made my year tour up there a little bit better. There was no television. There was only one radio station, and it was Armed Forces Radio Network, which had a lot of boring stuff anyway. Um, and so my duties primarily were I'd get up in the morning and go down to uh, the op center where the radar systems were and open up the safe and get the PMIs, these preventive maintenance instructions for that day's work that I had to do. And then I would go out into the equipment and perform these functions for testing the radar and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of the equipment was classified. And uh, so um, then after I got out of the Air Force, I came back to California and it was very ironic, too, because I stopped by upstate New York on the way back and saw a poster, Woodstock. 
And uh, I says, uh, I heard a radio station play a song, and then they mentioned the record company. And I went to the record store, saw the flyer, and says, you going to come to our concert next week? And I says, no, I got to get back to California. Boy, what I made a stupid mistake there. <laughs> I missed the whole thing. I could have gone to Woodstock. That would have been so cool. So anyway, uh, on my way back uh, in the U.S., uh, in California, I, I lived with my parents for a while in San Jose, and uh, I was driving around Palo Alto, and I saw this sign saying American Astrionics. I was, I was a technician just out of the Air Force. I still had my security clearance. So I walk into this company, and I said, uh, I says, what do you guys do here? Oh, we make operational amplifiers for the military. I says, oh, really? I says, I just got out of the Air Force. She says, you did? She says, do you, have a, do you have a security clearance? I says, yes, I do. She said, one moment, please. The next day, I wound up working there. It was that easy to find a job. If you worked in the, if you worked in the military and had a security clearance and lived in Silicon Valley, you could guarantee to get a job. It's that easy. Uh, after a while, I, I started getting involved with the anti-war movement a little bit, uh, and I really didn't like the idea of building operational amplifiers using missiles to kill people, so I decided to work for a national semiconductor, and I worked for uh, uh, Bob Wild, 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 Wilder. Uh, he is one of the top uh, analog circuit designs for integrated circuits. He worked in the LM101 series, LM741s. These are com common popular operational amplifiers today, and I worked for them for a while. And, uh, and I worked for Cartravision, the same Cartravision that Steve Wozniak eventually bought all that equipment from, and, uh, and just kind of moved around to various different companies. It was very easy to find work there. And during that time, I went to school and went to college and started getting my engineering degree. And uh, until I ran, and during that time also was when I ran into the blind kids and did all that blue box hanky panky stuff that we talked about so many times that I'm not going to cover today. So. That was pretty much kind of like my career. So my career actually has been hardware design, uh, analog, digital, both. I went into software only after running into, into call computer. And because back then I, I had to do a lot of electronic design work and I needed a computer program to do this because to design circuits, you can't just go down to your local computer store and buy a program, you had to write it yourself. So that was how I learned how to write programs, was just out of necessity. And so I, I started liking software better than hardware, got involved with the Homebrew Computer Club, and I think the rest is history. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the old Captain Crunch uh, cornflakes whistle way of hacking the telephone numbers or transmission, um, it was all acoustic still. The, the data transmission could be Actually, yeah, so one could have a, an acoustic idea of what, what data communication is. Now, nowadays, this is all lost because the frequencies are all too high. They are not within the audible frequency range anymore. Yeah. Uh, do you think something has been lost? What uh, McLuhan would have called it ac acoustic space. And now we are not in the acoustic space anymore, or are we even more in the acoustic space? Yes. boxes in operation by going to uh, wideweb.com slash phone trips and uh, go to that URL and in that URL you will find a lot of recordings made with tandem stacking and blue boxes being made where you get to hear the cheeps and the clunks and all the other things like that. One thing I might want to mention too is Berlin. Uh, I went to the CCC Congress in Hamburg a long time ago. And I wound up in Berlin, and uh, I was interested and intrigued about the German phone system. And I didn't, uh, didn't find any indication, maybe you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but they don't use in-band signaling in Germany at all. They, they're using pretty much some other kind of signaling between cities. And, uh, but I did get a chance to go over into the DDR, and I hacked a couple of the phone systems there. And uh, I was able to uh, drop into a juncture using some Stroger switches that they use. These were all mechanical switches back then. 
God knows what kind of equipment they're using, but I was able to drop dump into some very interesting, uh, interesting lines. I had much better, much better luck in Moscow. Uh, in Moscow, I actually hacked into the KGB system. Uh, the way that worked was when you dial a number, you can only dial zero. And when you dial a zero, you have 10 pulses come back. When you dial returns, you get those pulses. What happens you dial, when you dial 11 or when you dial 12 pulses? Well, we tried that out, and it did some very interesting things. Thank you very much. Have you had uh, ever any uh, 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 role models or people that you admire in your life? Yeah. That you look at and say, okay, they are great, maybe in the past and also today, people that are worth looking at? Yeah. The, the very first engineer I worked for at American Astronautics, his name was Harris. I looked up to him as a mentor in my electronic uh, information, and of course Steve Wozniak. I, would, I have to mention him because we spent a lot of time together back in the days before he worked for Apple, uh, just doing really crazy stuff, pulling pranks and stuff like that. I mean, this guy is definitely the prankster, for sure. I switched to German. Um, before we jetzt in the Mittagspause gehen, noch ein kleiner Hinweis. Um, John Draper ist hier in Europa unterwegs, weil er auch so eine kleine Charity-Tour macht, könnte man sagen. Er hat ähm, vergangenen Jahr ähm, wirklich äh, sehr aufwendige Operationen in den USA gehabt, die finanziert werden müssen. Wie Sie vielleicht wissen, noch ist Obamacare ja nicht Realität. Ähm, und äh, er trägt hier kostenlos vor, ähm, hat mich aber gebeten, und das unterstütze ich sehr, sehr gerne, ähm, eine kleine Spendensammlung anzuregen. Ich habe da vorne eine Tasse hingestellt. Wenn Sie rausgehen und mögen da was reinlegen, wäre das schön. Aber wir werden diese Tasse später auch an der Bar aufstellen, noch eine kleine, also für heute Abend für die Party, das wird so einen kleinen Captain Crunch äh, Tipp geben, also wenn Sie sich beteiligen mögen und ihm damit den Aufenthalt hier ein bisschen gegenfinanzieren und auch die äh, Genesung, die ja immer noch dauert, deswegen sitzt äh, Herr Draper da, dann würden wir uns sehr freuen, zumal es eine Online-Spendenaktion gegeben hat, die auch sehr fruchtbar war, die dann aber durch einen Hack und durch mehrere Missverständnisse sozusagen ins Wasser gefallen ist und nur ein Bruchteil der Spenden, die geleistet wurden, noch tatsächlich bei ihm angekommen sind. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Ich danke, I thank you very much. Ja, ähm, das Moment, äh, bevor ich, ähm, wir treffen uns dann um 14 Uhr wieder hier für die Vortragenden und die Helfer ist in, bei den zwölf Aposteln ein Tisch reserviert. But the last words go to John Draper. I understand a little bit of that German anyway to understand what's going on. So, uh, yeah, one of the things I'm doing now is I'm writing a book. And uh, we're not sure yet uh, which, of the, uh, which of the systems we're going to go with, whether we're going to go with Kickstarter, certainly not QuickFunder. Not, we're not even sure about Indiegogo. But one of these, uh, one of these uh, uh, systems that we're going to do... Uh, And uh, the book is about uh, halfway done now. I am working with an editor that lives in Spain. Earlier this summer, I was here in Germany as well, spent a lot of time here in Berlin. And, uh, and uh, I did some talks in Switzerland, in Paris, and also in, in one of our uh, clients. I worked at the time for a company called Golden Spear, and they make natural language processing for search engines. And I was able to uh, finish our particular uh, project on time and under budget. And as a reward for that, I got a $1,000 Eurail pass for 21 unlimited train travel all over Europe. I certainly put that to very good use.